we go. Hello, good morning, folks. Welcome to uh, yet another round of VMR. Um, every time I say that, it makes me sad at the eventual reality that hopefully many, many, many years from from now, I won't be able to say that. So I, I will savor every single time I get to welcome you all to uh, another Thursday edition of VMR. Um, this time, it's a all internal affair with one extra person actually in the discussion seat. We have uh, current attending and soon to be starting his first shift, Mark, who needs no introduction to the CP software's realm. I'll sk skip over that aspect, but highlight um, just how awesome it is that he's uh, not even at the one-year mark, and he's become synonymous with VMR. Um, I'm excited to see him taking the next stage of his clinical journey uh, in the non-CP solvers world. Um, you'll hear from him the most. Um, you may not hear much from Julia, who is powerhousing, scribing, and really, really uh, appreciate her doing that. Um, but hopefully, Julia, you put in your thoughts in the chat as much as you can. Uh, in the teaching points domain, we have uh, Yuki leading the way, assisted by uh, another VMR legend, Parisa. And a big, big warm welcome to uh, Patricia, who's one of our most recent uh, Academy members who is presenting a case today. So Patricia, why don't I have, hand the mic to you for you to say hello, and then we can hear uh, uh, from Mark and then jump right in. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good morning. It's super early. I don't <laughs> understand how much you are wake up this early because here it's only eight. But on your side, it must be six. I mean, shout out to you. Um, so I'm Patricia. I will be presenting a case for you today. I hope you will enjoy it because me, I really enjoy it like why I was rotating. So I was rotating with the hospitalist here in Houston. That's, that's where I I met the patient. So I would I really hope that you enjoy it. <laughs> 100%. We're really, really looking forward to it. Uh, it's perfect that you're rotating with the hospitalist because that's what Mark is up to. Mark. <laughs> Patricia, I completely agree with you. When my alarm went off at 530, I thought I was waking up for one of my residency ICU shifts, but no, it's, it's for a VMR, which I'm equally excited about. Um, but yeah, this is my first time discussing as, well, soon to be attending on Sunday, but not as a resident. So it's, uh, it's, really, it's really cool that this like this new chapter in my life, I'm really excited about. I'm excited to share it with all you guys. So yeah, can't wait. All righty. Um, we're ready whenever you are, Patricia. Okay. So in total, I have six aliquot, and the last aliquot is the diagnosis. For the first aliquot, we have a 39 year old man who came into the hospital with painful mucosal lesion. The symptoms started 10 days ago with flu symptoms like fatigue, uh, productive cold, nausea, <clears throat> body ache, and a fever at 39.8 degrees. Yeah. I might have messed up on my end, Julia. Are you able to share the screen? I think I made you co-host. Take your time, there's no rush. Um, meanwhile, I'm not sure. Um, uh, I'm not sure, uh, Mark, what how much of that you caught. Um, but yeah, let's hear your thoughts while we work on getting the screen. In. Yeah, and Patricia, just so I just so I um get the problem right, is it pain? You said painful mucos nasal mucosal lesions. Was that was that correct? Well, I think you're muted, Patricia. Yes, the chief complaint is 39 years old man. We came with painful mucosal lesion. Okay, and when, and when you mean uh, mucosal, uh, where in the mucosa are the lesions? Are they oral, like oral? No, or oral mucosal lesion, yeah. Oral mucosa, oh, awesome. Okay, perfect. Thank you for clarifying. Um, so yeah, this, you know, honestly, this is a, this is pr a problem that, you know, I've definitely seen, you know, in, in the clinic, um, not as much, you know, in the inpatient setting, I definitely have read a little bit about, but it seems like we have some painful oral ulcers with, with a pre pre uh, preceding flu-like illness in a young gentleman, honestly, base rate, um, 
aphthous ulcers are, are, are very common. Um, you know, many people uh, get aphthous ulcers and, and also herpes simplex is also very common. And sometimes like herpes simplex um, ulcers can be preceded by a prodromal flu-like illness. So in all comers, especially in the outpatient clinic, I've seen it many times, you know, HSV and just idiopathic aphthous ulcers are, are, um, are very common. So honestly, um, with, uh, Oh, is this? Pain? Oh, okay. Sorry, I thought it said necrotic for a second, so because that definitely would change. That definitely would change my my thinking. But um, I honestly won't go much past that. There's definitely a much extended differential um, diagnosis. The one thing that I'll say is that the ten day time course is a little bit of a red flag um, for me. I would say usually the patients that I think about and and kind of this prolonged like flu like prodrome is a little bit of a red flag for me. I think of most just patients I've seen um, like which HSV you know oral you know, ulcers, it's, it's not that much of a prodrome. So I'm trying to figure out how that would kind of work into my differential diagnosis. But, you know, if we move past, if, you know, if we swab the ulcer, um, and there's, you know, nothing going for HSV, if we get a history that this patient's had recurrent, you know, idiopath or recurrent oral ulcers, then maybe we would move into the land of like chronic infectious autoimmune, autoinflammatory. But I think here, honestly, I would do a really good review of systems here. Um, I'm thinking about a patient even uh, that I had in clinic for recurrent um, aphthous ulcers and some of the questions that I asked, but, you know, do a really good review of uh, systems of how this happened before. Um, has anyone in the family had this before? And any autoimmune or chronic and in infectious triggers um, is, is the kind of the questions that I would be asking. But right now I would just, you know, practice, Practically, I wouldn't move past the base rate until someone let, uh, something led me astray. That's very wise, Mark. I think that ultimately the problem representation, uh, an accurate problem representation is going to be key to understanding this landscape. And is this a acute monophasic progressive disease associated with a systemic syndrome? Or is this, in fact, a tail to this disease process that we can analyze? And the tail um, really uh, probably alters a problem representation to recurrent acute, which um, really mm -hmm. changes the landscape. It all also opens the door that the tail goes all the way back, not just to the patient, but also to their family members. So I completely agree with you that we really have to analyze um, the time course here because that'll be really, really important. Um, I would just uh, uh, emphasize that in a moment like this, um, where somebody is having a um, uh, a markedly concerning uh, oral pharyngeal syndrome, you a brief passing glance to the small but uh, uh, reasonable possibility that it actually extends further back, uh, ex uh, impacting potentially the trachea and the esophagus. Most patients like this patient who have such degree of pain will not be able to uh, eat and drink very well. So secondary consequences that are really, really important. So, um, as we as we as we try to do in VMR, where we're trying to dance between diagnostic and management reasoning, I think you can immediately off the bat expect that if the patient this sick with a symptomatic ulcer for this long, that you're probably going to end up giving them some form of intravenous fluid, and so that will that will be the empiric management strategy. That as you move towards it, the other big one is not to not to overlook the possibility that their trachea and their esophagus are impacted. Um, but yeah, I'm right there with you, Mark. I think the key next step is really to gaze at the past and see if this has showed up before, is to uh, gaze at the systemic fingerprint of this disease before uh, um, what is likely the magnetic attraction to trying to see what this thing is right before you in the mouth, to make sure you look back in time and look at the rest of the body to really capture the crux of the problem. In a patient like this who's in so much pain, it's very tempting to get tunnel vision on that ulcer. And I think um, your ability to resist that temptation and gaze elsewhere, I think, is going to be very, very important in this case. All right, Patricia, tell us more. And Robbie, can I mention one other thing? Um, I can, and I can definitely tell I'm I'm rusty because I always I always told my uh, my residents yeah. um, and and interns that like anytime you know you have a chief complaint, just like we talk about in 
and um, and VMR is just to always think about the the no misdiagnoses on day one. And as you were talking, I was also just thinking, you know, what are my no misdiagnoses that you know I want to diagnose right away in the ER or like on day one of admission? And just thinking about drug reactions, you know, SJS, TEN, dress syndrome, or just things you want to keep on your uh, on your mind. So those are early questions I would also um, I would also ask in my HPI because you know I've seen a couple of cases of SJS in residency, and initially they don't they don't look. Um, as sick as they can get. So they definitely can fool you. So I think um, just keeping that in the back of the mind will be very important when you review the med list. But yeah, Patricia, back to you. <clears throat> okay, great discussion so far. So as we said, the symptoms started 10 days ago with flu symptoms like fatigue, productive cough, nausea, body ache, and a fever at 39.8. After, after five days of malaise, he went to an urgent care where they treat him with COVID-19, where they treat him for COVID-19 with steroid pack and sent it home. The patient reports my relief, but three days later, he woke up with a large painful blister in his mouth. He decided to go to a facility where they gave him tungamicin and mouthwash for what they thought, for what they suspect has candidosis and sent it home. The patient condition is not improved. The sore worsened and the patient developed difficulties swallowing. He also noticed whitish discharge from his eyes and penis. That's when he decided to come to our hospital. A day after admission, the patient noticed a non-painful ulcer on the penis gland, and he had difficulty in sitting urination. For the review of system is negative, aspect, except for what we talk about. Yeah, that's it for the second article. Any clarifying questions, Mark, before we share your thinking? Um, and a quick question. Was the, was the COVID-19 diagnosis confirmed or was it presumed based? No, it was presumed. It was not confirmed. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, and uh, and then the penile ulcer, was that painful or painless? Non-painful. Non-painful. Okay. Okay. Um, and then last question. Has any of these symptoms happened before, like the penile, the penile ulcer and anything like that? No, it was all the first time everything happened to him first time okay awesome um yeah so the, this patient seems to kind of getting be sicker you know getting sicker and sicker before our eyes um you know the one thing that i'm just kind of keeping in the back of my mind is that you know this patient had a presumed diagnosis of covid 19 based on you know upper respiratory tract symptoms and a cough um got steroids and then possibly got worse with steroids. I'm definitely putting a pin in that. Maybe it was just the natural progression of the disease. You know, not many things get worse with steroids. And honestly, steroids are becoming more and more controversial because even a lot of infections that we previously thought got worse with steroids actually get better with steroids. But things that I always keep on better in back of my mind of getting worse with steroids is fungal infections, especially, you know, mucormycosis and, and aspergillus. Now, if it was just an isolated ENT syndrome, I'd be like, all right, you know, maybe this is, maybe this fits with mucormycosis mycosis, but um, now we're kind of getting more of a GU flavor as well. So maybe, you know, to my, if I'm remembering quick, I don't remember any, many GU manifestations of mucormycosis, but that's just like, again, no misdiagnosis that so you never want to miss mucormycosis. Um, and now we have, you know, also a, a penile ulcer, we have um, white discharge, uh, you know, penile discharge. Um, I think definitely things to rule out here are also sexually transmitted infections, especially in a younger patient, definitely would want to do a good um, <clears throat> STI review of systems and ask those uh, ty types of questions. Um, but again, I think a, a careful review of the med list is going to be very important because now we have I have oral ulcers. I have a penile ulcer. We're hitting a few, you know, mucosal sites. And I think Patricia also said that there was some eye discharge as well. So this is just, I'm, I'm, I'm very, you know, if I'm walking to see this patient, I'm very concerned about, you know, um, some sort of, uh, you know, um, emergent drug reaction. So again, careful review. Uh, I don't know, Patricia, was there anything else that the patient was given for the COVID-19 besides steroids, any antibiotics? Did Oh, okay. Well, what if you, if you don't mind me asking, what antibiotics were those? Oh, I think you're muted. Okay. Clindamycin. Clindamycin. Okay, clindamycin. Interesting. I, I don't, I don't always think of clindamycin as one of my top triggers for some of these, uh, you know, almost you know fatal like you know drug reactions. But the beauty of you know medicine in in, in 2024 is a lot of things we can just you know I could look up on the spot. I would definitely be running the rates of clindamycin causing some of these, um, these uh, these drug reactions. 
Um, and then finally, if, if, you know, we ruled out those, all those emerging causes, um, you know, this is the patient's first presentation of this, but, you know, diseases have to start somewhere. So kind of, I, I'm using more of my type one reasoning, not my type two reasoning, but some autoimmune diseases can cause, you know, oral and, and penile ulcers, something I think of like Bichette's it seems a little aggressive, I would say uh, for uh, Bichette's and um, yeah, kind of like rapidly progressive. But again, after you, you kind of rule out all those, uh, no misdiagnosis, just something, something to think about IBD, those kind of, you know, auto autoimmune diseases. Um, I'm going to, since it's like six, uh, 615 in the morning, I'm probably going to forget my uh, painful versus painless penile ulcer uh, DDX. I want to say that uh, HSV is, is definitely painful. I know syphilis is painless. I think LGV is painless. Chancroid, I want to say, is painful. And again, these are classic, classic associations, right? There, you could always, you know, you could always break the rule. I want to say Bichette's actually tends to be painless, um, but definitely going to be testing for all sexually transmitted diseases. I would love an HIV test in this patient too, that seems to have this rapidly progressive illness. Um, yeah, those are some of the big things. I mean, reviewing the med list, ruling out these, uh, you know, um, life-threatening drug reactions, doing a good autoimmune history again, and, uh, you know, rolling out some STIs are the big things for me. Yeah, tremendous progress, Mark. That was awesome. Um, just FYI, by the way, Patricia, I think your your mic is a little soft, so it's a little hard to hear you when you're presenting the case. Oh you might have to yell at us just to be able to hear you. Okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah, no worries at all. Um, it's really, really uh, intriguing to see the landscape that we're in, Mark, and I completely agree with how you're analyzing it. Um, uh, Patricia, just one clarifying question. Did he have any of the ulcers before he got any treatment? Or did the ulcers and the mouth and the penis and the eye discharge develop after uh, uh, the presumed diagnosis of COVID-19 and the treatment? Do you know? Um, the symptoms started 10 days. Yeah. After the 10 days, he, he went to the urgent care where he got the steroid packs. He didn't have any ulcer when he got the steroid pack. But five, five days, no. A moment, please. So, yeah, no problem. Okay, yeah, he didn't have any also when he got the steroid pack. I he, see. The ulcer developed a day, like three days later after he got the steroids pack. I three see. days later after receiving the COVID-19 and the steroid pack for the COVID-19, then he, he went to the urgent care again three days ago after realizing that he has a painful blister on in his mouth. I see. Very interesting. So if we're trying to capture this disease state, it seems that the patient presented with acute systemic viral-like illness first, and that illness evolved to a mucocutaneous disease characterized by eye discharge, by an oral ulcer and a uh, genital ulcer. And the evolution of symptoms from non-ulcerative to ulcerative, I think is very, very telling. And the uh, analysis about the evolution of the syndrome is tempered in part by the fact that an intervention was made uh, and several interventions were made, steroids and clindamycin. So we'll have to see whether the evolution of the syndrome was a natural evolution or one that was uh, um, uh, augmented or completely uh, channeled by the interventions. And I think, Mark, there's a little bit of a paradox that I think we're going to have to try to analyze here, which is now the patient's symptomatic across a wide spectrum of his body, his eyes, his mouth, um, and his penis. And yet there's no, in, no symptoms in between. So in some ways, this is a strictly mucosal disease rather than an extensive mucocutaneous disease. And that pattern of not involving his skin, I think, is something um, to be studied. And so that's one way this disease is declaring itself. And I think the other way it's declaring itself is thus far, he doesn't have to, he doesn't appear to have any visceral involvement in terms of uh, cardiopulmonary symptoms, nausea, abdominal pain, or anorexia as opposed to GI symptoms. So I think where I am at right now, truthfully, is I'm not in a situation where I am trying to pursue diagnostic 
testing, even though some considerations that you brought up, especially acute HIV, are going to be things that we test no matter what. But because I know that in an hour of real life exam and labs, we'll be able to have a much more nuanced problem representation that my mind isn't yet ready to be able to say, oh, I know what the problem is, so here's how I'm going to solve it. And the major gap in understanding what the problem is, is verifying the significance of these things on exam. How bad is the discharge? How bad is the ulcer? Um, what is their extent? Have we missed something on skin exam that the patient didn't notice or overlook because of how painful the ulcer is? And what is the visceral imprint of this disease? And I think that that strategy is something that has served me well in real life because it's often very difficult to start looking for solutions for, for a, a incompletely characterized problem. And so um, while many of our um, uh, early career uh, evaluation opportunities on exams or even in front of attendings push you to come to proposed conclusions to incomplete problems, I think in real life, it ends up just causing increased cognitive load with little return on investment. So where I'm at right now is how bad do these things look? What does the skin exam look like? And will the laboratory data give me a systemic disease? And so I'm waiting to really define this problem. And I think in the next two aliquots, we'll be able to define it much more, but we'll have to keep our eye open to any emergent things that show up that will um, el eliminate this luxury of being able to take time and define the problem. Um, so I'm really curious, Patricia, what do you have next in store for us to help us uh, zero in on this tantalizing case you're presenting? And can, can I mention one more thing? Sorry. Uh, as, as you speak, Robbie, things always just like pop into my mind. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I definitely, like, like you said, uh, I would probably almost do the most detailed uh, skin exam I've probably ever done on this patient, completely ungown the patient, look for anything that we could biopsy. I'm kind of just like thinking out loud, like, what diseases, if if there's no dermatological involvement, cause rapidly progressive mucosal, you know, like lesions? I'm kind of just, it's, 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 I mean, you know, we'll get more on the exam to see if there's any skin manifestations, but that's definitely not something that, uh, you know, outside of, you know, the, the drug reactions that I mentioned that usually leave some sort of skin, you know, fingerprint, like, you know, I, I feel like I, or, uh, you know, even the pemphigus and pemphigus like family, pemphigus foliaceus, fulgaris, all of those, like, I feel like they usually leave some sort of dermatological fingerprint. I think one of them might not. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's definitely not a problem that I've encountered if that's the problem that we're going to solve, like you mentioned. Okay, great. I hope you'll get more from the next report. So for the past medical history, we have no diabetes, no hypertension, the patient is not a smoker. Social history, the patient lives in in Houston, no history of travel, is a high school teacher, he has two dogs, no sickness contact, he reports one sexual partner, no new sexual, no new sexual partner in the recent month. For the physical exam, um, temperature is 39.4, blood pressure 113 over 79, heart rate 114, is saturating well on is saturating well on home air, general appearance is toxic and comfortable, the eyes are injected bilaterally, no itching, no photophobia. The ENT exam. He has multiple scrapable white saw that appear on the top of on the top on it, that appear in his mouth, the inner cheek, the upper palate, the outside of the upper and lower lips. Cardiovascular system is tachycardic, no murmur, no respiratory distress, except the heavy he has heavy cough. Abdominal system, no distension, the skin has no rash. Is warm. It's warm and dry. The genital we notice a one painless one painless ulcer on the shaft of the penis, easily bleeding. That's it for the fourth aliquot.
Uh, Patricia, I just want to jump in and I'll give Mark a second to think. Thank you so much for such a detailed and incredibly uh, well-presented exam. Um, I think like the patient's uh, ailment is so clear before us. Um, I also wanted to thank you. Ed. Your uh, your uh, voice is coming through very easily audible now. So okay. thank you for being on that. Yeah. All right, Mark, I bought you an extra 30 seconds. What are you, what are you thinking? I was just thinking about how sick this patient is. I mean, you know, we have a, a you know, temp of 39, you know, 102 Fahrenheit, tachycardic. And I think Patricia mentioned this patient was to toxic appearing as well, right? Yeah, and, and, and yeah, yeah. And a 39 year old, I'm very concerned. I mean, my management reasoning, my management reasoning hat goes on first. I was saying before my diagnostic reasoning hat, um, you know, you're going to presume this patient is, you know, possibly septic from a mucosal source or a skin source until proven otherwise. Um, so, you know, this patient needs likely empiric. I know, uh, hopefully Othra is not listening to me uh, as she's in her infectious disease fellowship. <laughs> I, pro I probably would give, you know, broad, spare, uh, broad spectrum antibiotics, at least at a minimum vancomycin to cover uh, MRSA and likely, you know, some, um, you know, gram negative coverage as well, given how sick this patient looks, um, if she blesses me with those antibiotics. But um, yeah, I mean, our our, our exam and, and uh, Patricia, just one, um, the multiple white spots was on, was that on the conjunctiva, the the um, it did it, it had white just discharge discharge from his eyes, but the eyes were also red. It was it was injected bilaterally. Mm. It was all red, like uh, red, red. I see. I see. <laughs> okay. The finger was all red. Okay, and absolutely no rash on the skin. It sounds like no ulcers on no, the skin. No, no rash. Ulcer. Okay. No. Gotcha. Um. Yeah. I mean, Ravi. I guess the thing that the that this ad is, it kind of, you know, confirms our, 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 pa our excellent uh, past medical history of the, you know, the, the oral ulcers, um, of the, uh, conjunctivitis, um, is what I'll label it right now. And then the penile ulcer, we have no, you know, we have no skin involvement at this point. Like, again, this is a, this is a problem, like rapidly progressive, toxic mucosal syndrome, you know, there's a acute progressive, you know, a mucosal syndrome, which is not something I've, I've seen many times. So like I said, I definitely um, would be given this patient's fluids because, you know, patients with some of these, especially these drug reactions, usually it's from skin loss when they have a, a lot of skin involvement can lose a lot of fluid easily. I know we have a good blood pressure, but definitely be given this patient fluids and, and, ana and antibiotics and really just trying to find, um, somewhere that we can swab, you know, I, you know, some ulcer, if we can swab the base of the ulcer to roll out an infection or, um, and, uh, or the discharge, the, the penile discharge. And, um, you know, I, I, yeah, I'm kind of, I, I'm just right now, just my management hats on. I'm trying to see if this patient has any end organ damage. I think, you know, if this patient has, you know, an AK, AKI, uh, you know, a Hepatocytic liver injury, maybe that'll be suggested that this is a multi system disease. But I, I do think this is already a multi system disease with our hemodynamics. But I think basic labs, including kidney function, UA, um, liver function tests, CBC, will help us see what other. Um, what other uh, sites, uh, organs are involved. And I'm kind of, I'm just still going back to our, still going back to our. Um, are preceding flu like a flu like illness. Like I'm also very interested in a chest x-ray as well, because, you know, we had, we had upper, mainly upper respiratory tract symptoms, flu like symptoms, but we did have a cough. Now, does that mean that, you know, there's something in the lower respiratory tract, there's something in the alveoli and the interstitium as well. And we have a pulmonary mucosal syndrome. Um, maybe then I can make a, a little more progress and think about, you know, infectious etiologies that infect the um, the pulmonary parenchyma and then the mucosa as well. So I think a chest x-ray um, would be very helpful. And then even maybe um, a, a CT chest of the chest x-ray is negative, especially if this patient's still having a heavy cough. Um, so yeah, basic labs, the basic STI uh, um, uh, test that we requested before, and then some pulmonary imaging, I think would be really helpful. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I, I think I just want to highlight just how dramatically this problem changes when you walk in the room and you see the patient coughing, 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 coughing. Yeah. The vast majority of patients who have a syndrome like this are not coughing. And so the fact that the cough here is so prominent that Patricia notes and notice it while just sitting there with the patient is very, very telling. And I think that that's, that's where um, the advice that I was sharing with you uh, all earlier is bearing fruit. You spend all this time thinking about the problem, but then you realize it's the wrong problem. And now I think you can update your problem and say, this is a 
a respiratory syndrome, upper or lower, featuring prominent um, uh, mucocutaneous manifestations, and all of a sudden you have a lot more clarity. Um, an angle in which to approach this is to really rec uh, to really um, uh, uh, make companion with the no with the notion that this patient was diagnosed with a viral syndrome before these prominent mucocutaneous manifestations uh, occurred. You can understand why the patient has fever, has nonspecific localizing symptoms, um, and that is very much evocative of a viral process. And I think the evolution of this disease process goes to show you that some viruses are really, really important to diagnose. And while you're diagnosing viruses, you should really keep in mind the kinds of non-viral infections that look like viruses. And so I think uh, in a case like this, you ask yourself, well, what viruses matter? And I think there is a few categories to think about them. The ones that matter in most instances are the ones that we can treat, which is a COVID and influenza. And so in most institutions, when you're trying to diagnose a viral infection in the United States, you'll have access to testing for COVID and influenza. And those viruses matter quite a bit. There's a second tier of viruses that we have to think about in certain circumstances, and that's the whole family of mononucleosis viruses, which, in, which most importantly include, include acute HIV, but also EBV and CNV. And diagnosing those conditions is really important for all sorts of things. So when I meet a patient and I'm getting the vibe that it's viral, I'm like, oh, is this COVID or influenza? Um, and do I need to engage into the second tier workup of sending HIV and other monoserologies? The last virus is super rare, but unfortunately on the rise. And it's another M, not mono, but measles. And so when you have cough, coryza, conjunctivitis, uh, and a high fever, you really have to think about that. And the good news is you'll know if this patient's vaccinated or not because he's employed in the United States, especially at a school where you might have uh, vac vaccination records. But if he's not vaccinated against measles, it would be really, really important to reanalyze that mucosal lesion and say, hey, are those actually complex spots? And is this patient having measles pneumonia? And measles has characteristic laboratory features like leukopenia and thrombocytopenia, but you might have to sit there and think, should I isolate this patient um, for the possibility that he has measles? But the penile ulcer would be highly unusual. And so that may give you um, uh, a reassurance that this deadly diagnosis is not at play. So I think the simple thinking is when you're thinking viral, most patients have a nonspecific viral infection where you don't have to diagnose it. But if you are on the hunch for a specific viral syndrome, think in three tiers, common influenza and COVID. Intermediate are HIV, EBV, and CMB, and rare, but really deadly is measles. Um, and this, by the way, we're talking about a systemic viral syndrome. We're not referring to localized viral syndromes like West Nile virus or uh, BK virus, which affect the brain and the kidney respectively. Uh, but in parallel, there are some bacterial infections that look a lot like viruses. Um, what's your list, Mark? Yeah, Robbie, as you were saying this, uh, a couple of yeah, thoughts it came into my mind. Because like, like you said, like when you're talking about viral infections, anytime I think of viral infections, I also think of atypical bacteria. And I kind of like ran my list of atypical bacteria, you know, Legionella, Mycoplasma, um, and Chlamydophila. And then I thought of a case that I had maybe, a, I don't know, two months uh, before I ended residency, a pretty severe mycoplasma and pneumonia and similar, I might've been younger, maybe like a, in the twenties, um, tear, you know, really severe bronchitis um, with a, uh, with like tree and bud opacity. I think I actually might've uh, sent it in the, in the WhatsApp um, that hypoxic. Um, and then I just did a little bit of reading about mycoplasma and then there's this syndrome. And I think there's an acronym for it, but um, that mycoplasma can cause, um, pretty bad ulcers. I don't know if it's this extensive. I know it definitely can cause oral ulcers. I don't know if it can make you this toxic though. It's a little, I mean, but you know, I, I think you've mentioned this before. It's like if patients like look like really high temperatures, tachycardic, it's like they're either super sick from like GNR sepsis or some really bad bacterial infection or common, common things. They just have a really bad viral infection. Um, but toxic appearing is not really common for, I guess, a viral infection, but I don't know if that mycoplasma, um, uh, that mycoplasma ulcer syndrome can make you look this sick. Mycoplasma is also associated with erythema multiforme, which is a mimic of SGS, um, can look exactly like it, um, you know, on, on, on path, I think as well. So it's kind of one of the things to run, um, when you have someone with SJS is, is, is a micro, you know, mycoplasma. So I'd be very interested in testing for mycoplasma as well. I'm not too familiar with Legionella. Legionella can do a lot of things, but I don't think of, 
mucosal involvement, you know, as much, you know, you have CNS involvement, you have, you know, kidney involvement, um, electrolyte involvement, but I don't think of the, the mucosal involvement as much. Was there anything else you were, you were thinking of? Yeah, no, I think mycoplasma is a lead contender. And I think that if you're really defining the problem space as a bacterial infection that looks a lot like a viral infection, the inlet into that is that the patient as a high fever and no localizing symptoms, or that they have a viral-like uh, uh, surface signature. So they have a, a morbilliform rash, or as we're seeing, a, a diffuse um, a mucosal disease. And I think mycoplasma is the lead culprit in terms of uh, prevalence, but the lead culprit in terms of morbidity is toxic shock syndrome, bacterial toxic shock syndrome. So if you uh, later learn that this patient had a foreign body somewhere, and the classic description is nasal packing or tampon, then you have a hectic syndrome featuring, featuring uh, mucocutaneous disease. The vast majority of patients with toxic shock syndrome have a rash, but I think it's morbidity would push you to think about it in this instance, even though there are many atypical features. Um, and then finally, I think rickettsial diseases, they can show up as a high fever and a diffuse uh, morbilliform rash. Uh, I won't spare anything, but I will tell you one of our academy members just discussed a case that was very, very similar to this that you all might hear about. Um, so, you know, I think if we're summarizing, Mark, I think um, the the realm of this, the, the evolution of the cough is, the presence of the cough is very telling here. I think helps us um, reframe our problem. And if you're thinking viral, think in those three tiers. And equally uh, important is to think of the three bacterial mimics of those three tiers, which is mycoplasma, toxic shock syndrome, and rickettsial diseases. Um, but I think, you know, that final dimension of understanding the problem is really key. We have the mucosa, we have likely the lungs or the, uh, or the airways. And then the question is, what is there another dimension that we don't appreciate yet? I think that'll help us really uh, make a lot of progress. All right, Patricia, I'm to you. Okay. The next one we have the labs. The WBC is 12.6, hemoglobin 13.9, 13 MCV 86.4, platelet count 323, um, sodium is 133, um, potassium 3.9, BUN. 27, creatinine 2.1, AST, ALT normal, CRP 285, ESR 54, ARC force 270, U urine analysis is normal, no, no white blood cell, no nitrate. Um, we did the serology because at that point we we ask for the infectious disease doctor to, to come in and to give us some advices. So he asks for the serology, HIV is negative, adenovirus negative, chlamydia negative, Neisseria negative. Uh, yeah, at that point, we mostly thought that the, the chest X-ray is negative too. At that point, we mostly thought that it, maybe it was um, herpes, HSV, so we we put the patient on a cyc That's it for the fourth aliquot. Thank you, Patricia. What do you what do you think, Mark? How how has your problem representation changed? Yeah, I don't think you know it. It's I'm glad the HIV test is negative. Um, I think that we do have uh, we do have other organs involved here. We have kidney involvement. We have we have liver involvement, at least from a cholestatic picture. Now, whether that's just end organ manifestation of sepsis, it's possible. Um, I guess that would be the, honestly the most common in the hospital. But given this patient has a you know a, an atypical presentation, it might be just uh, organ manifestation of this disease. I think a really important thing here, and this is at the top of my mind because of Academy VMR session, but is a UA. Um, because I want to know, is this, is this, I'm going to presume this is an AKI, you know, it's a 39 year, I'm going to presume they uh, have a normal creatinine at baseline. Is this a AKI with a very active urine sediment? And now we have lung involvement, possibly maybe it's a, our chest x-ray is now negative, but maybe our CT chest would show something kidney involvement and mucosal involvement that might push us towards maybe a rapidly progressive autoimmune disease. Um, to be very curious, is there any hematuria, pyuria? proteinuria on, on this UA, 
or is this just a pre-renal AKI from you know someone being sick for ten days? Honestly, it's probably that, but I think the UA would be very um, would be very helpful here. Um, oh, and the other thing, um, Pisha, was there any differential in the white blood cells? I know they were a little elevated, twelve put six. Was it all neutrophils and eosinophils? Mm, sorry, I I didn't get that. I just had the white blood cell count. Mm, it's okay. No worries. No worries. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of. Um, uh, that's that's where I would would move next is is a UA. Um, also, I'm just running my list of, the, again back to the Academy of VMR, kind of like the the no missed um, you know causes of AKI with a normal UA as well. Um, definitely would uh, our hemoglobin is normal, you know, so probably not hemolyzing. One thing for you know, Mike, I mean that doesn't rule out hemolysis, but one thing for mycoplasma, I think the most actually common extra. Um, uh, extra pulmonary manifestation uh, of mycoplasma is a warm, uh, cold or warm yeah, mycoplasma. I think it's warm. No, I think it's cold. Eh. Well, it's some sort of autoimmune hemolytic anemia that I could uh, look up, but um, uh, that is uh, the most common. So that I was kind of, I was very curious about the hemoglobin in the beginning. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where my head's at. I definitely want a UA. And honestly, I probably would have, if, if the resources are available, a low threshold to get a CT chest, given how heavy this cough is and how chest x-rays are are good but like they're just not great and especially when someone's so sick i just really want to know if there's any lung involvement um and then if the ua is very active it'll lead me down a, a very different path with you know i would definitely want to you know spin the urine probably do an autoimmune workup things like you know lupus anca all the all, all these other diseases so that's kind of where where my head's at right now. And, and from a management reasoning perspective, I'm definitely being very careful. I agree with the acyclovir, being very careful with the acyclovir with the creatinine of 2.1. Most protocols, um, at least at my hospital, there's a protocol to order IV fluids with a cyclovir to prevent the crystal nephropathy. So I definitely keep a close eye in this patient's labs to prevent any intratubular uh, crystallization of that acyclovir. Yeah, I think you all are hearing reason 100,000 to join VMR regularly and to uh, uh, present your cases because you uh, might have the opportunity to be invited into the academy and to learn from Mark, who taught us an incredible approach to a AKI, especially trying to tease out uh, the tension between common things like pre-renal and deadly things like mahas. And I think here, that's the tension that we have is the kidney part of this disease process. Um, and is it representative of a core feature of this disease like glomerular nephritis, or is it a consequence of what the disease has done elsewhere, i.e. reducing this person's ability to drink? And I think the same can be said for a mild elevation in alk is, is it a Is it a signature towards the disease process, or is it a distractor? And I think that's the tension we, we talked earlier about trying to update the problem representation. And the problem, updating the problem representation is not merely just absorbing any other new uh, abnormality. It involves really realizing what is a pertinent negative. And just because something is normal doesn't mean it's not helping you. And I think here, the fact that this patient isn't having an autoimmune hemolytic anemia is a pertinent negative. And if the person had an autoimmune hem hemolytic anemia, I think we'd make a lot more progress. So noting a normal hemoglobin is important. And not noting an abnormal creatinine and not incorporating it as a disease-defining entity is important. So the UA and the response to fluids will really help us. And I think you're seeing that the hardest thing in clinical reasoning isn't what the answer is. It's knowing what the problem representation is. And so what Mark is teaching us is he does not yet know if the creatinine belongs in the problem representation or it's merely a distractor and not a core feature of the disease. And I agree with how you're going to go about teasing that out. All right, Patricia, tell us more. All right. Um. So, Mark, you asked for the UA. We did the UA. It was non-relevant. It was all normal. And so we started him on V, and we did not notice any improvement after two days of treatment. And the HSV test was negative. So we decided to add prednisone. We put him on high dose steroid and the patient improved. The fever started to decrease and we conclude on the disease. So the last aliquot will be the diagnosis. Any thought on this aliquot? <laughs> I have no idea, Mark, so I'm curious what you're thinking. Okay, so um, I'm glad the UA was negative. Um, 
So, you know, less likely, you know, a multi-system, you know, like a vasculitis that, uh, you know, affects the kid, a glomerulonephritis that also has all these other manifestations. Um, you know, a lot of things get better with prednisone. Um, you know, I mean, that classically would push me to some sort of autoimmune um, condition. I mean, to be honest, like mycoplasma is, is get, likely going to get better, uh, with steroids, especially if there's, you know, like a bronchitis involvement, um, it's probably going to get better with steroids. And I'm sure, um, I am sure the, um, uh, I'm sure the skin manifestation honestly would get better with steroids from that. So I'm still keeping that in the back of my mind. Um, and I know that test wasn't given to us yet. So, um, a mycoplasma like PCR I'd be very interested in. I'm still, this patient just still seems a little too sick, uh, for running, you know, for mycoplasma. Like I said, I did see a pretty severe case, um, you know, residency of mycoplasma, but, uh, you know, I'm very interested, um, in, in that test. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I would probably do some sort of general, um, auto, you know, autoimmune workup. I mean, the, all, I mean, a lot of the oral ulcer syndromes, unfortunately, you can't really, uh, you know, or the ulcer syndromes are associated with autoimmune diseases. You can't really test for, I mean, like Bichette's IBD. I really don't think these are at play. This is, this patient's too sick for that. Um, lupus, um, you know, you could probably send it ANA. It might be low level positive and you might be chasing it, but yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty, I'm pretty stuck. Uh, I, I'm pretty stuck right now. Honestly, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm going back to, again, still to this pre, if this was just a preceding, like, um, like a just viral URI that was rhinovirus could have that triggered some sort of multi-system inflammatory syndrome, like not HLH, but just some sort of, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm very, I'm very stuck right now. This is a, this is a really tough case, right? What, what do you think? Yeah, no, I ultimately, I'm glad the patient got better. And I think the yeah. question, again, the same tension what do we do with the fact that the patient got better with prednisone? And I think the question is, did they get better because of the prednisone or did they get better in spite of the prednisone? And that is a key thing to try to incorporate into your problem representation. We don't know the answer to that. And so I think that um, this is the challenge of clinical reasoning. If you could say the patient got better because of prednisone, it'd be easy. This is a steroid responsive condition, likely autoimmune. And so the question is, did he get better with uh, or despite? And I think that's going to be impossible to know. So you have to go back and analyze this case independently and really realize that there are very, very few primary autoimmune diseases that get this hectic this quickly. So how, what kinds of autoimmune diseases make somebody so sick so quickly? There's not many of them. And in fact, I would venture to say that I can't think of a single autoimmune disease, a pure autoimmune disease that gets somebody this sick this quickly in this manner. There are ones I diagnosed yesterday. I saw a patient with PMR who came in with two days of horrible symptoms, started like that. Um, so some can, and it's a good list to, to know, but it's not, it doesn't, I, not, nothing I know is compatible with this. So I think the question is, is this an infectious condition or is this a post-infectious condition or is this a drug-induced disease process? And I think the real tension in this case is, is the infection driving it all? or has an immunological trigger that is not infectious been invoked, i.e. a drug or a, um, or a post-infectious phenomena. And I think that, um, you know, for drug-induced diseases, for them to remain strictly mucosal would be unusual. Um, there is an entity called a fixed drug eruption, which, is a, which can be, be uh, uh, strictly mucosal, but it's usually not extensive. So for me, I'm toggling between, is this an infection or a post-infectious phenomenon? And so I'll pull up on a visual the infections that I think are compatible with a case like this. Um, and here they are. Uh, I'm focusing in on a small aspect of the schema because I mean, you get overwhelming otherwise. And so um, I think mycoplasma testing would be very, very helpful. And the way that mycoplasma would be consistent with this case is the patient got better in spite of prednisone and that a mycoplasma serology of PCR would be positive. Um, there's no evidence of toxic shock syndrome, no exposure to rickettsia that we know of, but this patient is in Houston where there is a, um, uh, where scrub typhus may be uh, prevalent, but the mucosal signature would not be compatible really as far as I know. Um, we heard that the patient had HIV negative, uh, could this be Coxsackie? Very possible. Um, uh, unlikely to be an arbovirus because the patient isn't part of, uh, and epidemiologically we're a part of virus. Um, but could this be COVID? And were they right about COVID? 
And does this patient have MISA or uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome from COVID? And so I don't know. I think this is one of three M's, either mycoplasma, MSA, or hopefully not measles, but probably not measles if the patient got better with prednisone. Um, and I think it depends on what you say. Do you say this patient got better because of steroids, in which case MISA might have been your answer? Um, for MISA to cause such extensive mucosal uh, disease is without rash is unusual, but um, the conjunctivitis and the home and presumed pulmonary involvement is certainly in keeping with that condition, as is the leukocytosis. Um, I think based on how sick this patient appeared, you probably lean MISA over mycoplasma, but I think my next curiosity would be, what are the COVID serologies, which are, are often needed to diagnose this post-COVID infection? And what are the myco, uh, mycoplasma serologies? I think those would be the things I would invest in most. But you've had some time to collect your thoughts and think more. Mark, what is what is your uh, what is your uh, 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 reflection now? Yeah, it, it, Patricia, how how high was the dose of steroids, and how how long did the patient get steroids for? Like in the because the patient stayed in the hospital for five days, he got high dose of steroid, like eighty milligram per day, and he got well after one day of steroid. The he was able to swallow because. During the this during his hospital say he was not able to swallow because of the ulcer, but after one day of surgery the ulcer started the the pain in his mouth started to decrease and the next day he was able to swallow, and even the the ulcer on his penis decreased like he looked better, even the patient in general his general condition got better. Gotcha. Yeah. So, I mean, pretty high doses of, you know, of, of steroids um, and, but just like completely melted away the syndrome. Thank you for bringing up MSA, M-I-S-A. That's what I was uh, trying, trying to say. I was, I was fumbling on that. I'm honestly, only, I've only read about it. I've actually never, I've never seen a case of it. I, th I think of it like HLH, um, kind of these just like multi-system, just hyper-inflammatory disorders. And the cases I've seen of HLH, like the patients are just so I've only seen them in the ICU. The patients are just so sick. Um, and they definitely have not got better with, um, just one dose of steroids. If the steroids truly made the patient better, it seems like I'm leaning a little more towards that now, given how quickly it almost seemed like it had a PMR effect. When you give that patient with a PMR, just a little dose of steroids. And they're like, wow, I feel a million times better. Um, so I would definitely read a little more about MSA, MISA and see like, are these patients, you know, can they get that much better with just some steroids? Robbie, have you seen patients with MISA? Like, do can they just get can they just get better that quickly with steroids? I've never seen it. Um, yeah, I, yeah. yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah, I've never seen it before. I can't wait to learn from this case. It's certainly yeah. something. There's, there's a different twist on. You know, I think with the classic description of MISA, there's cardiac involvement. There's a lot of GI involvement. But you know, the more and more I'm thinking of this case, the more and more I think the alkphos, the creatinine, they might be intrinsic markers of the disease rather than uh, um, just from not eating and drinking. And so if you reframe this case as a, muco uh, as a mucosal disease with prominent visceral manifestations, I think that's where it really increases. Uh, uh, I, I do think that, you know, our analysis is really strongly predicated on there being no tail, that this is an acute progressive syndrome. And that's where I think Gosh, you, you hear, I heard Patricia just emphasize how quickly he got better with steroids, like just one day later. And so part of my mind is saying, wait, is this autoimmune? And the only way I can reconcile this with this being autoimmune with my current, the current knowledge base is there for, for there to be a previous chapter to the story. And that may not be apparent either because the patient's too sick to tell us or the patient had subclinical episodes that he discarded from his memory. It's very, very, it would not surprise me if he truly has had prior mild ulcers, maybe even on his genitalia when he was a much younger and doesn't remember them because it didn't cause any problems. So I think the, yeah, this is, if this is truly acute progressive, I think MISA would be, be make the most sense to me. He's around a lot of people with his work, um, but gosh, I can't, I, can't, I can't wait to learn. That'll be the most important thing. Uh, at the end of the day, the only thing I can tell you for sure is Patricia, you presented this case in such a rich educational way. We're having so much fun trying to put it together and uh, excited to hear how you did it. So we since um 
as I say, we asked for the infectious disease. When he realized that his World Cup was all negative, he moved away from the inf infectious part. And since the CA, um, CRP and ESR was elevated, we started to think more about autoimmune disease. And the one that we we concluded was Bichette disease. So we asked for a follow-up with the rheumatologist and yeah, that was it. We kept the patient on steroid and we start to reduce like gradually, gradually. But when the patient left the hospital, it was much, much better. Yeah, that was it. And fortunately, unfortunately, I saw that in the chat, they were asking about the pathology test. We tried to do that, but it was also negative. Yeah, but we still conclude on Bechet's case. Yeah, I think it's very possible. Uh, I think Bechet's disease is a disease that's defined by its very hectic uh, imprint on the surface with no, with little to no imprint on the inside. I think the counter argument against Bechet's disease is, mo is if you didn't find a prior history. I think that that may make it a little bit tricky to anchor on it, but I think that's it goes to show you that um, that many autoimmune conditions are always uh, uh, a diagnosis based on a clinical judgment. So yesterday, when I told you I diagnosed the patient with PMR, um, I would easily see one rheumatologist saying, no, it's not PMR, and another saying it is PMR. It's just based on how the patient describes the story. And so I think I think the conclusion of Bechet's disease is really how predicated on you being confident and your infectious disease consultant to being confident it's not an infection. And I think a post-infectious phenomenon is always falls in between. Is it really an infection or not? So I'm just glad the patient's better. I think the tension is, will this happen again? And I don't know the answer to that. If it truly is Bichette's disease, it, it probably will. Uh, if it's not Bichette's disease, it probably won't. And so this is why when you spend enough time with rheumatologists, you'll often say, this is a tentative diagnosis of blank. So in the note, I told you I diagnosed a patient with PMR. The rheumatologist did not write that. She wrote, presumed PMR will study response to steroids. And so I think if I were to venture a guess, I would say this is presumed Bichette's disease um, pending a clinical evolution. And if it never evolves again, and then I think you might go back and say, oh, wait, what did this person have? It doesn't matter because he's better. If it evolves again, I think you've confirmed the diagnosis. That would be my take. Uh, but it goes to show all of you, and I'll share what we had the mic to Mark in a sec. It goes to show all of you that really rich educational cases, I think, are ones without a clear conclusion and ones that allow us to really uh, uh, bring reality, which is most of the cases that we see in real life are always think it's this, but time will tell. And I think Patricia, you're showing us such a great example of that today. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, Mark, what are, you, what are you thinking? No, I mean, this is real life. Patricia, I, I really applaud you for just bringing this like real life case. I think like watching the natural history of disease of a disease is so cool. You know, um, it's like, you know, putting, I, I encourage all of you guys too, that are uh, just starting in the hospital, even if you're you know, already in the hospital is like make a follow-up list of your patients. And there's patients that don't have those, that diagnosis um, yet, put them on a follow-up list and just see how they do over time. Because I think I've learned so much um, from doing that. So I think a lot of times in the inpatient setting, we see that the final DX, you know, we see someone at the end of their course and, you know, we kind of just ask questions about the natural history of the disease, but it's really cool to see that kind of unfold, uh, you know, in, in real time um, from a clinical reasoning perspective, obviously you never want, you know, things, bad things happen to patients, but just from that purely clinical reasoning perspective, the one thing I'll, I'm just interested in is this, you know, URIs are very common. Um, so was this URI true, true, and unrelated? Because to to my understanding, I don't think you know Bichette's is usually triggered from a preceding like viral illness. So I'm very I'm very curious uh, about that. But again, like you know rhinovirus, you know what you know all these viruses are super common. So this could have just been a you know a URI, and the patient if they had Bichette's was going to get all these manifestations anyways, even if the URI uh, didn't happen. Um, and how sick the patient is too. I'm very, you know, very, very curious um, about that uh, with the high fevers and, and the tachycardia, but such a real life case, um, really, really, really cool. And I think too, that highlights, you know, that like 
Bichette's um, just from reading about it a little bit is that the only thing that's really sensitive, you know, for, for Bichette's is that, you know, the oral ulcers, the penile, even the penile ulcers, I think it's only like 70% of cases, then everything else, even like pathogen tests kind of falls in the 60 to 50%. So it's a really hard diagnosis to make. And I think the HLA testing is also not, um, not great um, as well. And I think also the demographic is expanding. We're learning about Bichette's as well. I think classically, we learned this like small demographic. Of, I'd be curious to, um, to hear where this patient is from as well, to see if it fits that classic demographic. But you know, so cool. Just real life, which real life is, uh, it's always cool to have, have these cases at VMR. Thank you so much, Mark. Patricia, I'm really curious, what was it like for you to be part of this care? What did you learn uh, from uh, from real life? And what were your experiences here? Uh, but for, for me, it was, it was really rewarding because, as I said, the patient came in really toxic. Yeah. And when he left the hospital, it was he was feeling much, much better. And also, it was also my first time to see a presumed Bichette disease because we thought about all the infectious causes that could put someone in that condition. We didn't find any. All the tests was, were negative. But with Bichette, Okay, we all we only had like the OR ulcer and the penile ulcer, and it was also interesting to to read about the disease. How has my Mark mentioned it was difficult? It's a difficult diagnostic to me to make. I I wish I could have followed the patient like yeah. even with the rheumatologist to see if it was if the A ANA and all those tests was positive, but I couldn't. So, but it's really Bichet disease is a rare, is a rare disease, and also it's a diagnostic of exclusion because we don't really have like, a clear way to diagnose it. But it was the first time for this patient he didn't have any ulcer before, so we thought might we thought maybe it was a flare up, like mm -hmm. first time it can be a flare, the flare up. That's why it was also so sick at the beginning. So it was it was interesting to get involved in, in this case. I I learned the management because uh, when when we came, when he came we didn't know what he had but we still had to manage him to give him fluid antibiotic even if he was not working at the beginning but you still need to give something to help the patient. So it was also interesting to see that part of the of the process. Absolutely. Yeah, that was that was interesting. <laughs> Amazing. That's all wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm so glad that you went from really sick to really, really well. Really, That's all that matters at the end of the day, honestly. All right, Yuki, the mic is yours. What are your teaching points today? Okay, uh, first thing first, uh, Patricia, thank you for your fantastic presentation. I enjoyed a lot and learned a lot from through your case. And I really, really appreciate um, your educational discussion from Dr. Ravi Mark, thank you so much. And um, today's case is a 39-year-old man with a tender health of oral uh, mucosal lesion, accompanied by a flu like symptoms and high fever. And uh, this patient had a com all ulcers. So common all ulcers is uh, like um after on HCSV, and before jumping into the other differential diagnosis, never miss diagnosis, gonna be a drug reactions on uh, Steven Johnson syndrome, it's like um, emergent cutaneous drug reactions. And uh, based on the, this patient's time course, on, on time course and frequency of full like symptoms, gonna be a red flag for systemic disease involving uh, cutaneous regions. And so before jumping into uh, differential diagnosis, uh, management wise, uh, considering pain management and IV fluid therapy, cause all skin involvement uh, causes a lot of fluid loss. And after that, look at other parts of body for regions. And um, based on the history, uh, if the patient has a same thing got worse than real choice. It got it'll be a um, fungal fungal disease like a mucosal aspergillus. And the, today's patient has all ulcers and penile ulcers, so mucosal involvement. Um, not only drug reactions, but also with all the immune like a patient IBD gonna be your differential diagnosis. And this patient also had um, penile discharge. So it's really concerning for STIs. So um, we need to ask a lot of questions about STIs. 
And um, in terms of gentle ulcers, if that came from, uh, we, we need to think about uh, HSV or chancroid, or if it is painless, we need to think about syphilis. And uh, when it comes to differentiating mucosal versus uh, mucocutaneous differential diagnosis, uh, we need to check, look for skin exam, detailed skin exam. And um, based on health vitals, uh, these patients are really toxic, it's toxic, so we need to raise suspicion for um, high infectious diseases. So we need, we need to start bank if required. And uh, to look for the causes of this, the symptoms, uh, we need to order a test, including um, kidney, a UA, a liver, like a basic labs, CBC, and this patient had a cough. So we need to look for um, lung images, including a chest x ray, CT, and uh, SDI panels, mucosal skin, also culture as well. And um, this patient had a high fever, so high, high fever and a lot of organ involvement. So we know to think about viral causes or non viral causes. Um, regarding viral causes, COVID and cool is manageable, so it's going to be a never miss diagnosis. And um, mucocutane, this patient has a, if this patient has a mucocutaneous regions, HIV, CMV, EV, EVV, got to be a diagnosis list. And measles, it's kind of rare, but it's going to be a bit deadly. So we need to look for all the or some cyphenia or um, um, in regarding to um, the viral atypical bacterial infections. Is, uh, is it going to be a pitfall? So we need to check for them. And um, this patient didn't have a um, nasal pack or tampon, but um, TSS is a uh, cause of a rash, skin rash, whereas um, high fever, um, toxic presentation. So it's, it's also an important differential diagnosis if this patient has skin rash. And, um, and then um, other, um, based on the lab result, this patient has other organ involvements. With toxic presentation, so sepsis is quite um, important diagnosis. And um, HSV is quite common with oral manifestations. So if we use acyclovir, we need to watch for crystal trulopathy. So we need to um, use a lot of IV fluid to prevent this condition. And um, uh, based on this patient's history, uh, this patient got better with steroids. So for autoimmune condition is raise a suspicion. We need to raise suspicion for autoimmune condition. So start autoimmune workup. So for example, PMO, if patient has a PMO, PMO response relative steroid or uh, fixed drug options, cause a recurrent skin reaction at the same site, or uh, MS, MI. A uh, is really similar to uh, LHLH, where else I have involvement to involvement. And today's final diagnosis was surprisingly breached. So, in terms of the breached, uh, all ulcers is quite common. And um, seventy five percent patients had uh, penile ulcers. Yeah, <laughs> that's all. Thank you so much. That was so good. Thank you for narrating that whole journey from beginning to end, including the management pearls and all the small pearls about all the conditions we talked about. Uh, uh, really awesome job, Patricia. Thank you for an incredible case, Julia. It was epic scribing. Uh, thank you for re rebounding when your computer crashed on you. We really appreciate it. Uh, Mark, that was awesome. Really, really enjoyed discussing with you and uh, hope to see some of you guys tomorrow for our lunch. Bye.